Okay, so um, once again, I'm Drew Leader, uh, and in addition to my university duties, uh, I've been serving as a volunteer teacher of philosophy off and on uh, for many years, going all the way back to the 1990s, uh, which reminds me how old I'm getting at this point. Uh, old enough so that I'm actually seeing people released from American prisons <laughs> who are serving life sentences. Uh, and often it's now 30, 35 years later, uh, and they're finally getting out, uh, a day I never thought I would see. Um, mostly I've been in male maximum security prisons, um, most recently a women's medium security prison. And we've done all kinds of different sorts of philosophy, Asian, uh, African on occasion, Western philosophy, issues like free will and determinism, um, or particular figures like Plato or Lao Tzu or, or Buddha. Um, and I particularly like to work with uh, lifers um, and really long time, uh, you know, long-term prisoners, uh, which is a little contrary to the conventional wisdom that you want to pour your educational resources into people who will be getting out into the community in the reasonably near future. Uh, that's certainly true, but at the same time, I found that, and I've been told that people are kind of one foot out the door. Uh, they're only around for a certain time to undergo that kind of therapeutic or educational experience. Uh, and they also are um, already kind of, you know, focused on the future and maybe uh, what education will do for them professionally. Whereas as a philosopher, I have found that the really long-term prisoners have developed a certain maturity, a certain kind of uh, introspective reflective capability that they themselves said they didn't have until a few years into imprisonment. Uh, and I'm also kind of fascinated by human encounters with extreme adversity. Uh, and what does it mean to negotiate, uh, you know, really long-term confinement? Uh, and how could philosophical tools be of value to you in finding uh, meaning in your life, even if you're a lifer, even if possibly the entirety of the rest of your life would be spent in prison. Um, and I've really been inspired by the way in which people have taken up the material they've been offered uh, and utilized it in a way that they have said, has it you know, really been kind of life-saving or um, intellectually and spiritually meaningful to them, which of course is the goal in all of our teaching, uh, you know, when we're dealing with undergraduates at our host universities. Um, but at least at Loyola, people often encounter philosophy as a core requirement. So in a funny way, it's almost like a prison sentence that they have to serve before they're released with a, with a degree. Whereas in prison, it's kind of the opposite. This is a zone of of, of freedom in which they're treated not as a criminal per se, but as a student, an intellectual philosopher. Uh, uh, and it's an experience they look forward to and take maximum advantage of. Um, so in my other life, my other professional identity, so to speak, I have a medical degree and I'm very interested in kind of the philosophy of medicine particularly the phenomenology of health and illness and impairment, uh, how people negotiate chronic pain, chronic illness, and also their contact with the medical system. So it doesn't take a great leap of imagination to see how I sort of brought these two together in my mind and said there are a lot of reduplicating structures when you're coping with a chronic illness uh, that is constricting and disrupting you from within, and when you're dealing with chronic incarceration and the constrictions and disruptions that are being imposed upon you by the state. 
Um, so I was interested in the phenomenology of those kinds of experiences and also the healing strategies that people use to adaptively cope, uh, survive, and even thrive under those conditions of extreme adversity. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, enough of a, a, a preamble. Let me start with the experience of space and time, that interconnection between our embodied subjectivity and the life world. Um, and beginning with the experience of space, there's a constriction that takes place uh, first in the case of chronic pain, illness, and impairment. Uh, and then I'll go on to say how this is also clearly applicable to those who are serving um, long-term and, and even life sentences. Um, in the former case, when dealing with, with, with illness or pain, um, we have a uh, reduction of world that kind of emanates from the inside out. It's initiated by bodily dysfunction. There's a narrowing of perceptual and cognitive focus. For example, when I had a very painful um, peripheral neuropathy and nerve disease for a number of years before it was um, fairly dramatically improved from surgery. I could literally take out uh, a pen and draw for physicians, which I would do the exact site of the pain. It was about the size of a, a coin just above my ankle, but it was painful enough so that it really restricted my walking. It, you know, once again, drew all my attention. Um, and this experience of, you know, kind of the reduction of spatiality to the site of bodily impairment or pain, uh, and also the reverberating effects of that impairment or pain in terms of how it may lead to a, a bedridden existence, hospitalization, uh, immobility, um, such that the compass of your life world has been narrowed. Uh, and of course, something extremely similar happens when you're incarcerated. You're placed within a cell, uh, which might be the size of a bathroom in a regular house. Uh, and you're confined in there for years and, and for decades. Um, and even though you have uh, a limited amount of mobility, it might be through a small prison yard or to a particular library room. Um, obviously, you're held within um, bars and barbed wire and, and prison walls. Uh, so there's a severe restraint of lift spatiality and agency in both cases. Maybe the closest equivalent to that experience of incarceration is hospitalization for those who have serious illnesses. Uh, and then once again, your movement is controlled in a similar fashion where you're meant to be in a particular room. There will be corridors that are prohibited from uh, you uh, patrolling with freedom. Um, and you'll largely be held in place while physicians, medical students, relatives, etc., cetera, come, come and visit you. Uh, if you want to move from one place to the other, you might have to do it through a wheelchair or under the surveillance of hospital personnel. Um, so along with this constriction and disruption of lived space, we have something equivalent in relation to lived time. Um, pain pulls you particularly to the now. It constricts your focus. Um, in philosophy, Heidegger, for example, uh, says that we are beings unto the future. We organize our activities in relation, relation to anticipated future goals uh, and bodily habits that we have built up in our past. Um, so the present is not just a sliver of time. The lived present really contains all of these what he calls ecstatic dimensions of time. Ecstatic meaning to stand outside of oneself. Um, but in severe pain and illness, that time contracts and we, kept, we keep being brought back to the now. 
by uh, bodily sensation um, and, and bodily impairment, disfigurement, uh, disability. Um, pain in particular, I'm going to quote from a very famous chronic pain specialist, Dr. Warwick. And he says, quote, chronic pain mirrors incarceration. It essentially puts you in its cage, keeping you locked up in the penitentiary of the present. It becomes difficult to plan for the future and can very quickly shrink your life. So we see um, this person making quite explicit the theme of this talk. Um, similarly, um, it, it doesn't uh, take much uh, thought or imagination to realize that imprisonment is a profound disruption of our ordinary temporal experience. Uh, in fact, we call it serving time or doing time. The judge pronounces a, a sentence upon you, and that's a, a sentence of time, like you are to serve 20 years. Um, and, and similar to someone who's suffering from chronic pain or illness, the present closes in inescapably. Uh, you may remember a better past before your capture. Uh, you might anticipate a positive future post-release, uh, but the now, the present takes on this repetitive quality, kind of like a, a hellish version of Nietzsche's um, eternal recurrence. Uh, where prisoners have said, I, I fall asleep and I dream that I'm free, and every morning I wake up, I find myself back in my prison cell. Or people who are suffering from chronic pain may feel free of it once again in dreams. They wake up and from their very moment of awakening, uh, they realize uh, their level of bodily limitation and, and bodily suffering. Um, so uh, enough about that. I'll just say that when you try to go to the past or the future, it's not a fully satisfying experience. You know, whether you're incarcerated or whether you're ill, there may be feelings of regret and loss in relation to that past uh, or the kind of elusiveness, um, the uh, expectation of a future, but one that seems never to be arriving. Um, so let me switch focus from the individual who is coping with this constriction of their life world to the way in which we're profoundly social beings um, and the way in which illness and incarceration both disrupt our sociality. Um, for the sick person, uh, there are many different levels of isolation. There's the way in which when you're in pain, uh, it's your pain alone. Another person might sympathize and be empathic, but they're not experiencing the sensations you are. Uh, and to some degree, language isn't a very good medium of communication. Uh, you can try pointing uh, the painful spot in your body. Uh, you can describe it as a all pain or throbbing pain or stinging pain, but there's a kind of paucity of language uh, whereby your suffering is almost incommunicable to others. Uh, and once again, even if they're empathic, they can't really um, go fully with you on your journey. Um, Jesus at one point says to his followers in the Garden of Gethsemane, stay awake with me through the night. Um, and one by one, they fall asleep. And there's something of a comparable phenomenon where it's very difficult for people to stay fully awake to the person who is suffering, the person who might have a fatal illness or might be in pain. You forget about it. You go on with your daily lives. Uh, and, and sometimes you deliberately turn away from it because it reminds you of your own vulnerability. Um, and so it can lead to a sense of sort of social exile for the person who is suffering with that chronic illness, whether it's a very uh, visible disfigurement like the amputation of a limb, uh, or the flip side, a really kind of invisible illness like chronic fatigue syndrome, where people don't see the signs of it, 
so they forget about it. They expect you to behave just like a normal person uh, and you feel quite isolated with what you're struggling with. Um, similarly, the, the criminal quite obviously has had their social relationships disrupted. They've been taken away from their home, from their family, from their community. Uh, they've been placed in a fundamentally alien environment. Uh, their ability to communicate with the outside world is restricted. Uh, their letters might be read and approved by a censor, depending upon how high security a situation they're in. Uh, it can be problematic and even humiliating for family members who are trying to visit. Uh, maybe a, a big distance they have to come to wherever their loved one has been incarcerated. Um, and so at least the prisoners I work with say that over the course of time, even good friends and family members drop away. Maybe they're there for the first five years, but 10 years, 20 years later, you're, you're forgotten about um, and life goes on without you. Um, and even in relation to other members of the prison population, you might find there's a lot that you have to protect yourself against or withhold. You don't want to show uh, too much depth of feeling because that might show weakness or vulnerability. Uh, and so you're guarded, uh, not only literally with the correctional guards who could report you for any kind of violation, uh, but even often guarded with the other prisoners. Um, going on in terms of the disruption of sociality, uh, I talk here on the PowerPoint slide about disciplinary, I'm using a term from Foucault, disciplinary depersonalization and disempowerment. Uh, for the sick person, illness itself can be very depersonalizing because suddenly the body machine is breaking down. Uh, the illness um, takes you over in a way that seems profoundly impersonal or antipersonal as it disrupts the narrative of your life, uh, your goals and your wishes. And then when you go to the medical system to try to get relief, to try to recover a sense of agency um, and healing, it's kind of a double-edged sword. And I think those of us who have been, you know, deeply embedded in interacting with doctors or uh, the bureaucracy of hospitalization probably know what I'm talking about, where you're treated as if you're an organ system or your set of values that have come back uh, from diagnostic laboratories. Uh, and in many ways, it's the job of the medical system to objectify you and try to find the biomedical sources of your illness. You're not doing something uh, bad by doing that. You've requested it of them. But at the same time, it can feel very dehumanizing as if no one is really paying attention to your experience of illness and suffering. Nobody's really encountering you simply as one human being to another. Um, and uh, this is very similar, of course, to something the prisoner experiences, where uh, just like you get a number, uh, you're banded and give it a number when you go into a hospital, the prisoner is assigned a number and they're banded, at least in an American prison. Um, there is surveillance and record keeping in both situations. In many ways, the, the document, the patient's chart becomes paramount. Uh, often I've seen a physician and increasingly instead of sort of looking me in the eye and talking with me personally, they're looking at a computer screen because the time pressure is such and the bureaucratic demands are such that they have to be constantly not only looking up my patient record, but actually recording me, even in the course of the hospital visit. They don't have 15 minutes after the visit to record the results of their examination. Um, so it's all taking place simultaneously. Uh, and similarly, the, the criminal has their actions uh, under surveillance and recorded. Any kinds of infractions, which in America is called getting a ticket, of course goes on your record. 
uh, and we, we speak about person people having their criminal record and when they come up for parole it's their record that is being looked at just like for the patient it is their hospital record it is their chart that becomes paramount um, it's not surprising according to Foucault that we would see these kind of echoes because he says the modern way in which power uh, and uh, power bearing structures unfold uh, is through modes of discipline where the body uh, is um, being surveilled, it's being monitored, its movements are being controlled uh, and, and being recorded. And in a way your subjectivity comes into being through these uh, modes of objective record keeping who define you, who you are in relation to the larger institution. So I'm just gonna quote from Oliver Sacks, who's uh, kind of a famous, uh, uh, I think both originally British um, neurologist and, and writer, where uh, he had a very serious, I think it was a skiing accident. He developed his own neurological dysfunction and became a patient. And he says, quote, one's own clothes are replaced by an anonymous white nightgown. One's wrist is clasped by an identification bracelet with a number. One becomes subject to institutional rules and regulations. One is no longer a free agent. One no longer has rights. One is no longer in the world at large. It is strictly analogous to becoming a prisoner. One is no longer a person. One is an inmate. One thing I do want to say before I go too much further into um, the healing strategies employed by sick people and by incarcerated persons is to say that, oh, I've been treating them as if they were kind of two different populations. Uh, in many cases, they're one and the same because um, many people who are incarcerated fall prey to or already are suffering from chronic illnesses uh, and are not offered um, sufficient medical care. And I just have a couple of charts here on the PowerPoint. Once again, this is referring to American prisons but you can see uh, the kind of yellow bars are the percentage of the population in prison that are suffering from different chronic illnesses. For example, 16.7% uh, of inmates with asthma, uh, if I can read this correctly, about twice the rate of people in the general population. So many more people are su suffering from chronic illnesses in prison uh, and in the chart on the right, you see how this is getting worse over the years, not getting better. Um, so let's say 2004, we had 13.8% of uh, people in prison suffering from hypertension, high blood pressure. By 2016, it's up to 22%. It's probably actually higher than that. Um, and, and being in prison itself can cause high blood pressure, the kinds of pressures and tensions you're under become internalized. Uh, and a number of people in the class that I'm about to talk more about um, have died uh, prematurely during the course of serving their prison sentences. Um, I, but having said that, let me look a little bit more positively toward strategies of healing. Um, I have a new book that's almost out, at least it is in my mind, it's coming out in October from Northwestern University Press. It's already quote unquote available if one were to pre-order a copy, um, but it really will go on sale in a few months. Uh, called The Healing Body, Creative Responses to Illness, Aging and Affliction. Uh, here we've been talking about different modes of affliction. Uh, and on the left side of this PowerPoint, you can see a kind of, uh, what, I, what I think of as a kind of chessboard of healing, where there are different possibility spaces that are open to individuals to move when they're suffering from bodily breakdown, bodily disruption, bodily constriction. Uh, and where did I get these kind of 20 different possibility spaces, this five by four matrix? 
I really took it from 20th and 21st century phenomenology of embodiment, uh, the notion that there are fundamental structures of embodiment that to some to limited degree might be thought of even as transhistorical and transcultural. Uh, for example, the way in which I am my body and its powers are, are really my own. Uh, we say, you know, kind of, I move through the world, not my body moves through the world. But on the other hand, I have my body, something that somehow feels perhaps separate from the essential self available to the public view. Once again, it can break down and combat my wishes for it. So I'm both subject and I'm object. Uh, I'm, I, the body is that which separates me off from others and individualizes me but it also connects me with others. There's a profound circuit of intercorporeality of which I am a part from the time I was in my mother's womb uh, uh, and, and continue to be as I become socialized into an adult. So we have these kind of fundamental structures of embodiment that allow you to take that example, to move toward your body, to embrace it, um, to listen more carefully to your body when you fall ill or conversely to move away from your body, to which to escape it, refuse it, ignore it, or transcend it. Uh, when you fall ill, you, there are these different kind of chess moves you can make, so to speak, um, created by the structure of the lift body. So let me focus primarily now on uh, not so much illness, but how these methods are used by people who are incarcerated. Um, for example, the methods involved with escaping your body, since your body is that which is being held by the state. Uh, I'm going to quote from that book I had the image of earlier, The Soul Knows No Bars, where we were permitted to record our philosophy class. And then I worked off of uh, edited transcriptions of those class discussions in writing up that book uh, in conjunction with the um, uh, incarcerated persons who are represented. So Tony Chapman Bay comments, you're stuck here physically and the only place you can grow and move is mentally. So we do. If a man goes to jail for five years, he'll read more books at that time than the average person will in 20 years. And reading can expand the mind. Books can take you anywhere across the water into space. So we see the way this kind of mental intellectual development can kind of take you out of your bodily confinement. Uh, let me quote from Charles Baxter, who's a, a Muslim imam who's finally about to be released about 35 years later. He says, man is created from one cell and as man grows, he adapts into another cell and that cell's also a place for growth and development. When you read the Quran and the Bible, you see that different prophets went into the cave for comfort and isolation. And the cells like that cave. Um, Gandhi, when he was imprisoned in Yerafta prison for fighting British colonialism, renamed it uh, Yerafta Mandir, uh, Yerafta Temple, because he said, I can do the same kind of meditation, thinking, contemplation, prayer, and writing. Uh, in this prison cell, as I would do in a temple cell. Uh, and we see that represented in the, in the very word penitentiary, that the prison cell is modeled after the monastic cell where monks would go to engage in prayer and fasting and penitential self-reflection. Um, unfortunately, in the modern day penitentiary, uh, there aren't a lot of structures that really um, encourage you to use it in that kind of constructive and transformative way. It's become more a place for uh, punishment and segregation uh, and security on behalf of the larger society. But we still see um, prisoners who in a way are recovering and utilizing the notion that I can use this time of inner confinement uh, to grow intellectually and, and spiritually. Um, and actually at my university at Loyola, we've distributed thousands of copies of a brochure um, giving different meditative methods that one can use when under confinement 
uh, and organizations that will help give you resource materials, uh, whether they're Christian or Buddhist or Hindu or secular, um, for developing a contemplative practice. Um, let me quote from another individual, John Woodland, um, who once again talking about kind of ignoring and refusing your bodily confinement and the circumstances of the confinement. He said, we always had a concept around here about keeping yourself distant from prison activities and the prison mentality. Don't think about fixing up no cell to make it comfortable. Let it stay raggedy. You want to keep a mindset that this is not a place for me to get comfortable. Otherwise, you're not really going to be seeking release. On the other hand, going back to Charles Baxter in the course of this classroom discussion, he says, I call my cell my palace. As a matter of fact, I just got it painted last week. I paid the dude four packs to do it, four packs of cigarettes. He painted the floors, my ceiling, the whole thing. I got my oriental lugs laid right down. I don't care where I'm at. I'm going to make it heaven while I'm there. Even in this hell hole, I'm going to find some heaven. And so I'm going to put up uh, the PowerPoint where we're talking about these um, possibly conflicting strategies that individuals choose, whether to escape or embrace their body and their circumstances. And once again, it's similar to those with chronic illness who either move toward their body, listening to and caring for it, uh, or develop capacities to free themselves from bodily limitation. Um, so these are somewhat those kind of spatial strategies, but let's talk a little bit about temporal strategies. Um, once again, some people really try to escape their time of confinement. They turn their focus toward the future. Um, and I have heard people say that unless I really focus on that time of release and remain confident I will be released, even if I've been given a life sentence, I'm going to grow depressed, I'm going to grow mentally ill, I'm going to grow suicidal or even commit suicide. And they've seen fellow prisoners do that uh, if they lose hope, if they experience despair. Um, also, turning toward the future allows you to engage in those processes of personal and professional growth uh, and even kind of formulate the pre-release plan that may impress the parole authorities uh, and help you to actualize what you're envisioning. Uh, but the downside is all that focus on the future can kind of vitiate the presence of meaning. Uh, as if life will only begin at that time, which might be three years off or seven years off, when I will be able to resume uh, a normal and a, and a free life. Uh, there are other prisoners who say, you know, life is happening right now, even if I'm a lifer, I'm going to embrace my present appreciatively, even within this averse environment, just the same as people who have cancer, uh, and they might even have a fatal diagnosis, nonetheless may be very appreciative of the present and their loved ones and the special moments they have remaining to themselves. I was very impressed when we were, we were studying a Buddhist text called Awakening Joy. I really remember a prisoner uh, utilizing one of the recommendations, a kind of meditative process where every time you say, I have to do this, reformulated as I, I get to do this. Uh, and he said, you know, I have to go to prison and eat that shitty prison food. But then because he was working with this practice, he turned it around and said, you know what? I get to go to the cafeteria. I get to eat breakfast. And there's so many people in this world uh, who are living a situation of food uncertainty. Uh, I know that I'm going to get three square meals. Um, and I've seen people in prison in really aversive circumstances have joy, laughter, uh, read literature, be close with their friends, take classes, pray, meditate, appreciate simply being alive when so many of the people they grew up with are dead because of um, uh, drug battles and uh, you know the prevalence of, unfortunately, um, guns uh, in, in American society and in Baltimore, where I'm from, at least they're alive. Uh, and I do hear people say, prison is the best thing that ever happened to me. 
just like sometimes people say, this cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. It, it helped me to reestablish my priorities and, and live fully in the moment. Uh, and I, I do hear prisoners saying this slowed me down. Like life in the streets was moving so fast. Uh, if it weren't for prison, I probably would be dead. It made me take a, a new look at my life uh, and where I wanted it to go. I finally understood what my grandmother was trying to get into my thick skull. Uh, so once again, to some degree, this notion of uh, a penitential and transformative process takes place not through the agency of the institution where there isn't all that much to support it, but primarily through, a, in my experience, kind of the internal um, dedication that uh, people go through often when they're serving uh, long sentences. Um, so I think basically the last thing I want to talk to is to pivot again to that notion of, notion of, of social isolation and depersonalization and dehumanization um, versus how do you heal socially? Um, once again, let me return to um, prisoner comment. This is from Trey Jones, Orlando Jones, who finally has been released and is working for uh, the Georgetown University Prison and Justice Initiative. Um, he says, when I was in the cell with T, um, the only cell buddy who I really got along with, a bond developed and in our closeness, we were so brotherly. It seemed like I had more room in the cell with him than I do now when I'm alone, now that I have uh, you know, a, a solitary cell. We'd play cards and we'd talk and it felt like there was a lot of room. Um, so this also goes back to with spatiality. Um, uh, when you're close with those around you, it creates a sense of communality uh, and, and even a sense of increased um, emotional and experiential room. Um, prison authorities don't always like that. Uh, sometimes they feel that prisoners who affiliate too deeply with one another may be engaging uh, uh, criminal tips or, or engaging in criminal activities uh, or maybe developing a power structure that would be threatening to um, the power structure of uh, those who are trying to enforce security in the prison. Uh, and sometimes prisoners are simply transferred or they're moved to new cellmates or to a new prison because they're seen as becoming uh, too close with others. Um, I also have been very struck by the relationship that prisoners develop with animals. Uh, these are not only human, but, but, but transhuman relationships that are developed with, um, with stray cats uh, or with dogs that are being uh, trained by prisoners or even by rats or mice who live in their cell. Um, and this curious phenomenon where it actually is very humanizing, rehumanizing for the prisoners to be interacting with these um, non-human animals. Uh, there's a famous quote by the philosopher Levinas, who says that the only Kantian I encountered, the only person who treated me as a and unto myself rather than um, simply an object of use uh, when I was in a concentration camp was the dog. Uh, and, and similarly for prisoners, the dog sees them simply as a human being who cares for them and who pets them, not as somebody identified with their criminal record. Um, so the, the last thing I'll say, I hope I haven't exceeded too much of my time limit, um, is that I don't want anything I'm saying about the capacity that people have for um, adapting and coping and even healing and going in positive directions in prison to be distracting from uh, the real deep misgivings I have, and I'm sure um, you all have, about um, essentially creating the equivalent of a chronic illness by putting people under circumstances of long-term incarceration. Uh, once again, what I've been arguing is that you're essentially sickening people 
experientially, you're creating a disease, a loss of ease, a loss of freedom. Uh, and it's unlikely that for most people, it will be healing to be um, fundamentally sickened uh, as, as punishment for their criminal or antisocial behavior. Uh, and of course in America, and I think probably in the UK, uh, there are also factors of race and class in terms of who gets caught up within the carceral, carceral system and who are subject to this kind of punishment. Um, so, I think for most people, probably being imprisoned um, leaves them worse off than they were to begin with. Um, they're brought into contact with other criminals. Um, they're subject to punishment in ways that can uh, make them uh, very anxious, very angry, um, physically ill. Um, when they're released, they carry around this label of being an ex-felon that may make it more difficult to get a job, to get housing, to get social services. Um, especially in long-term imprisonment, they're more out of contact with the modern world. They may not have access to internet. Uh, they may be um, not conversant with the new forms of technology. Um, so block after block after block is placed in, uh, uh, obstructs the very pathway they're told to follow, that is to reintegrate into society, to get a job, to be a productive citizen. As no surprise that at least in the United States, something like two thirds of prisoners are reincarcerated um, within about three years of release. I've heard somebody say that uh, if you wanted to deliberately manufacture criminality, you couldn't do it in a more efficient way than doing it through the current form of the criminal justice system. So now we have to pivot really to thinking about preventive medicine, not end stage treatment. In this case, preventive medicine would be focusing on reducing um, incarceration, dramatically reforming the ways in which we incarcerate people uh, or even abolition of our current criminal justice, not our criminal justice system, but our current system of incarceration. Um, so thank you for listening. I very much look forward to your comments and to a discussion. Okay, thank you so much. It's just absolutely fascinating work. Um, so I just wanted to pull out three things. Um, that, that sort of follow or, or struck me about what you were saying. Um, I could pull out any number of them, uh, but you know, people like threes and <laughs> don't have much time. Um, so I was thinking about the idea of waiting, which was sort of explicit and implicit, you know, in, in some of what you were saying. And this can be such a feature of, of both illness and, and sort of experiences of healthcare in particular, and, in, and of course, incarceration. You know, I, I work, among other things, on Samuel Beckett, so perhaps I would seize on this, <laughs> um, you know, and, and what happens as Vladimir in um, Waiting for God, I puts it, when time has stopped, you know, <laughs> and that play is described as a, as a play where nothing happens twice, you know, that experience of waking up to the same, um, the same sort of nothingness or the same sort of experience of life in abeyance that gives an audience that, that perhaps something, of, um, some sort of inkling of what you're describing um, but what it is about modern life in a way that um, that makes us feel like that's a lot you know how this why this is a resonant sort of metaphor for for a larger experience and I was thinking about the fact there's just been this huge project in the UK called waiting times that the Wellcome Trust has funded about the experience of waiting in healthcare um, which involved literary scholars and philosophers and, and practicing medics and psychotherapists I don't know if you know of it, looking at waiting in the UK system um, and not 
patients waiting not just because of the debilitating effects of their illness or the, the temporality of their treatment plans, the logic of it, but also because of the lack of resources in the healthcare system. You know, this disruption of those plans, this disruption of any sort of ordered sense of, of cure or of, or of treatment um, and leaving them suspended in pain or even sort of dying while waiting. And it was just very resonant um, so with, I think, some of that work very resonant with the suspension and with the sort of loss of agency in the prisoner's experience. Um, and I was thinking about the way the health service in the UK has been in a sort of crisis that's so long and profound that kind of, you know, it's become a chronic condition. So crisis and chronicity have sort of <laughs> collapsed into one another, um, you know, that the systems are, are sort of sick in, you know, in, in um, ways that were sort of, yeah, that chimed um, with, with some of the things you were talking about in terms of the social context for these things. And Eric Kadzin's work on the already dead is looking at that. I mean, actually in the American context, but that sense of a sort of people being kept alive by treatment, but dependent on a system of treatment and, 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 that, and still having that experience of suspended animation of sort of loss of agency that's, that's you know, bound up with the, the economic kind of context of, of healthcare. And so all these sorts of different ways in which the systems are imposing situations of waiting. Um, and I was also thinking um, about the assault on selfhood that you talk about in, you know, from, from different angles and what scholars of language would call deixis, um, which is so much sort of in, in what, what prisoners are saying about themselves and about perhaps what you're saying about them as well. You know, the ability of language to conjure, conjure presence and refer to the self in the here and now and how that gets changed and distorted. Um, and our ability to name ourselves, you know, being taken away, obviously, when um, when the sort of part or, or just a contingent kind of accidental feature of somebody becomes, you know, the way that they're referred to. Um, but also that assault on the way that the here and now is experienced, you know, what, what Minkowski, who I know you invoke, <laughs> calls the me here now, um, so essential to mental health, you know, and I was thinking about work in the philosophy of psychiatry on the way that that's, that's attacked in sort of, in um, conditions, experiences of mental distress, um, but how that's also these social conditions are, are also, um, you know, damaging languages, ability to gesture outside of the self to the world um, and, um, and to engage with the world in that way, the language of reference and presence comes under pressure. And that really just struck me in relation to things that I look at in, in language studies. And I'll, I'll leave it there because I know there's a lot more to say, but thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate everything you said very much. Uh, on that notion of the waiting room, I think it's probably called the same thing in the UK as the US. It establishes a hierarchy of power. You know, you wait for the doctor, the doctor doesn't have to wait for you. Um, and really conceiving a prison as just like a big waiting room, like you have to sit and wait for potentially 30 years. And as you say, sometimes we really have to wait uh, dramatically a long time to access medical care. Um, and also what you're saying about kind of the ability to name and to use a language, the extreme kind of restrictions on prisoners being able to talk in their own voice to the outside world. That's one reason I try to really quote from people and write with prisoners to get their voice out there. And uh, we were talking with Anna the other day about how in artwork, when art done by prisoners is exhibited publicly, the name of the prisoner who did it is prohibited from being shown. It simply said the prison in which they did it uh, which once again is this robbing of the capacity for personal expression. This, I mean, your work is um, it resonates with so much um, of kind of the scholarship I'm familiar with in prison studies and in the sociology of punishment more generally. But I think you give it a whole new kind of flavor, um, and and it's extremely kind of accessible, uh, refreshingly accessible in that sense as well. So I really really enjoyed the the chapter and look forward to the book as well. Um, I guess as a sociologist um, of prison, um, I was interested in, in, in the analogy you draw between the experience of chronic pain and of 
of the pains of imprisonment, as it's referred to in the criminological literature. Um, and um, I guess I wanted to um, ask, um, what do you think might be the implications of suggesting that the experience of punishment is embodied, is not, um, um, is felt through the body, is experienced um, through the body and, and in many ways is perhaps a painful experience um, in, in physical and psychological ways together. Um, and I was interested in this idea that you mentioned um, around the problems of language in communicating pain um, in, in cases of chronic illness. And that's also a very common feature in, in uh, work with prisoners. They will often say, I struggle to express what punishment feels like and hence why they might resort to other ways of expressing their punishment, like the arts or taking different kinds of courses that might help them communicate differently. Um, and, I, and I suppose I was interested in, in, um, in your thoughts on how we might share the experience of punishment in a more public way um, and whether this embodied lens is helpful in that direction. Um, in relation to that, I, I, I really um, kind of enjoy your, your work on, on this issue of time and space and how it's kind of um, perceived in, in the context of carcerality in particular. Um, but again, as a sociologist, I wondered if there is something to add there um, about the simple fact that bodies are social. They are gendered, they're racialized, they're classed. And, and so how they will perceive and, ex and deal and cope with things like isolation or how they might choose to s escape um, um, their, their punishment is very much conditioned by those biographies and identities um, that they bring in. Um, and then uh, my kind of second more substantive point is in relation to how far we might stretch this analogy between chronic pain and, and imprisonment. Um, you suggest in some parts of the chapter that um, ultimately I mean, you say in, the con in your conclusion in particular that um, prison is, uh, is a kind of pathology. It's, uh, it makes people sick. Um, and, and, and I really like this notion of embodied injustice that you referred to um, and, and would like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, but I wondered whether there are any potential caveats or quotation marks risks of stretching this analogy between chronic illness and imprisonment too far. So for example, um, would in this analogy be, um, be suitable to say that medical authority is akin to that of penal power or of state power or state violence um, and isn't at the end of the day um, medical discipline and the kind of the, the problems that come with that um, the result of, of our inherently compassionate attempt to treat illness and to cure. Um, and so in a way, I, I wondered how far does this analogy go and, and, and in what ways um, it might kind of help us understand punishment perhaps differently or understand its contradictions perhaps. Um, and then just to, to end, um, I, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about your methods, uh, your, your kind of approaches. You you um, bring kind of a very philosophical kind of perspective to how we might interpret the lived experience of imprisonment and of chronic illness, but you do so drawing on, um, an, on an interesting range of sources. So in the bigger chapter, in the bigger sample of the chapter that I looked at, you reference some literary works, uh, a play, um, Tolstoy's work, and then you also bring interviews from uh, prisoners or discussions from prisoners in the classroom. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about how these different kinds of approaches help you do the kind of philosophy that you want to do. Thanks. Good. Um, let me see if I can remember yes. <laughs> in order some of the really interesting issues and questions you raised. But, you know, one thought, just to start with pain, um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how um, uh, I visited the Tower of London a couple of days ago, uh, and we've moved away from the infliction of pain, torture, as a primary way of punishing the criminal, to confinement. And so in a way, it does become harder, I think, for the prisoner to express and for people to understand 
the modes of bodily suffering that eventuate nonetheless. Because as you say, the body does remain uh, a primary site in which uh, penal justice is meted out. However, it doesn't uh, take the form of we're going to put you on the rack and make you physically suffer. It's more that we're going to place you within a very confined space and overcrowded conditions for long periods of time with um, and so it I think it it I don't want to say it's more subtle but to sort of tease out how that is still a form of bodily suffering uh, and still very register it still registers in the embodiment uh, as well as what we might call the mind of the prisoner I think does take a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a phenomenology, um, which obviously, you know, is something of what I've been trying to do. Um, and you know, that might have to do with your last question, what are your methods? I don't really know what my methods are, um, because unlike somebody who is in, I don't know, a sociological field where you really have to do an empirical study and you have to show data, Philosophers have the privilege of um, not necessarily having to move in the quantitative, scientific direction that has been so powerful within the academy. So I think when you try to tease apart a lived human experience, it is valid to go to literary sources. It is valid to talk with individuals themselves and try to quote their words. It is valid even to introspect on your own elements of your own experience when I've had to deal with illness, for example, or mm -hmm. what it's felt like to step within the prison. Well, at the same time, understanding that that method, like any other, will have its limitations and will have its unconscious social biases. Um, and and vis-a-vis -vis embodied injustice, which is something I have to think about as a, as a white man uh, who often has spent most of his work in male prisons, has had less contact with female uh, prisoners. Um, I've you know, become aware, let's say, to fo focus on racial issues, which are very powerful in Baltimore in the United States. Something like two thirds of prisoners in the United States are persons of color, whether black or Latino. Their communities are more police, they're, they're treated differently by prosecutors, by judges, et cetera, and they end up very disproportionately incarcerated. Um, and in the phenomenology, let's say, of, of figures like Franz Fanon, what does it mean to have black skin? Uh, you already feel under surveillance. Uh, you already feel inhibited in your movement. You already have a kind of doubled awareness of the body as experienced from within, but as viewed from without by a society that has already delegitimized it or brought it under suspicion or condemned it in advance. Uh, so that when you come into prison, it's almost like a fulfillment of the prophecy uh, or it's a synergistically redoubled assault upon the body that already was begun simply by your presence within a racist society. Um, and I think, you know, s certain similar observations might be made around gender, uh, but I feel least competent in that area. I will say that when I've taught in women's prisons, I've become aware, well, things actually kind of work differently there. Women interact differently. They, they deal with their incarceration differently. Um, and that might be, uh, you might be in a better position and will be in a better position to, to, to speak to that than I would. Thank you very much. This was great. I just want to very quickly tease out two uh, sorry, extensions in, 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 the, 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 in, in the paper. First is this idea you mentioned in the end about the need to think, since we're thinking about incarcerated, especially as social illness, we need not only to focus on, on those strategies, but to think of the need of preventive medicine, right? 
So my, my small provocation that, but if it's a social illness, then we're not talking about prevention, right? We're already sick. So like, although it's the preventive medicine in the sense of preventing those people from going through that specific suffering, we should think about this as the need to, it's to broaden this, <laughs> this and to uh, uh, perhaps the, 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 the intervention, the therapy needs to come sooner, right? The, by the time they are in prison, it's already in the middle of their uh, uh, yeah. journey. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. And that leads me to the second, perhaps a minor point that you, you talk about healing, the name of the book is Healing Body, but then you mentioned most of what you talked about were coping strategies, right? And I guess coping can be seen in a different light, right? Coping is not healing. You're just helping people somehow manage their conditions so that they don't go crazy or don't get worse, right? So it's an interesting, and, and I can totally see how some of these strategies can actually be healing in the sense of can help them feel better, can help them perhaps develop a different relationship to their condition, right? But it's an interesting uh, tension that I felt there in the sense that you know, if we're talking about a social illness and we're helping people just cope with it, how does that relate to the fact that we actually need to heal not only those individuals in a way, but, but society more generally? Yeah. I hope that makes sense. I, yeah, I think it, it, it's a really good point um, that uh, the, the illness, the social illness, so to speak, is not simply incarceration or criminality. It's the, preconditions of unemployment or racism or the dehumanization of the modern world, uh, the fracture of community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, the social healing, the preventive medicine really needs to take place, ideally creating a, a better, more just community and, and world or else we will keep sort of producing this particular mode of dysfunction. Um, and of course, what we do with prisoners and criminals is we say the mode of dysfunction is localized over there. It's confined to this dysfunctional sector of society. I suppose too, it's, it's one manifestation of a much broader dysfunction. I think in terms of healing, I'm using that as a term for uh, existential wholeness, the recovery of wholeness um, in relation to the modes of disruption and fracture and constriction that I've been describing. Uh, and I, I perfectly agree with what you say that I'm including it, you know, within my analysis, things that are more just like, how do you cope? How do you survive day to day? Uh, and the other is like, how do you really thrive? How do you lead a meaningful, fulfilling life? Um, and it does seem to me there's kind of a continuum when you learn how to survive and, and cope with the prison environment, you may be on your way to learning how to lead a whole and meaningful life, whether in prison or whether outside of prison. Uh, but I'm not sure there probably are discontinuities too. Uh, and as I said at the very end, there's a danger uh, to bringing up case studies of people who have done you know, exceptionally well in coping with adverse prison circumstances and using that as an excuse uh, for the, the horrors that are perpetrated um, through incarceration. And can I say thank you very much to Professor Peter for absolutely wonderful uh, uh, talk and, and conversation. Thank you. thank you all for coming along. It's been really delightful to be visiting University of Warwick.